Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on today's Great Challenges broadcast, which is sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Great Challenges program invites conversation on some of our most complicated and intractable public health issues. And today we'll be talking about risk perception and exploring how we can better arm patients with a realistic understanding of their risks to encourage healthy choices. I'm James Maskell, the founder and CEO of Revive Primary Care, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Um, I'd like to get started by asking our guests to introduce each of them themselves. They'll probably do a better job than me, so maybe we can start with uh, you, Brian. Sure. My name is Brian Zickman Fisher. I'm a faculty member at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. My background is in decision psychology and behavioral economics, and most of my work is in the question of how do we help shape the ways in which we present quantitative health data to patients or to the public to make it more intuitive Make it better, make people better able to understand the usefulness of that data to help guide their their health decisions. And I work in a variety of different kinds of contexts, but that's the common thread that that weaves through all of my work. Excellent. Well, great to have you here on the talk today. And how about you, David? So my name is David Bell. I'm an associate professor at uh, Columbia University. I'm actually an adolescent medicine physician, uh, and I'm the medical director for a family planning clinic and a unique adjunct, uh, the Young Men's Clinic. Awesome. Great to have you on. Uh, Thomas? My name is Thomas Workman, and uh, I am a, a principal communication researcher and evaluator at the American Institutes for Research. Uh, I work directly with our Center for Patient and Consumer Engagement, which is a great part of the work that I do, uh, working with KOKORI, uh, Aligning Forces for Quality, and doing quite a bit around um, comparative effectiveness research and evidence-based information that can help people make decisions. Uh, my past was working at Baylor College of Medicine with the Effective Healthcare Program as well for the Eisenberg Center. Great. Well, welcome. And uh, last but not least, Glenn. Yeah, my name is uh, Glenn Elwin. I'm based at uh, Dartmouth College um, uh, here in New Hampshire. Um, my background is as a family doctor. Um, I worked in the UK for many years. But my, my, my interest in terms of research and implementation is shared decision making. How do we make um, options available to patients that they understand them well? Um, how do we encourage clinicians to what we call diagnose preferences, um, things that matter most to people? Um, and I'm really interested in creating tools and measures so that we can drive this area forward. Great. Well, thanks so much, each of you, for joining us. As ever, Ted Bed has a, a dynamite lineup of speakers. You know, uh, it's easier than ever to find out what's going on in our bodies and, and soon to be easier than and even that with uh, the new smart watches and, and so forth. But we know already how diet and exercise impact heart health, about how the mechanisms by which cancer spreads, about bad effects of illicit drug use, and even about what genes mark certain diseases. But with all of this information, we really continue to make decisions that may not be the best for our health. So what is it about human psychology that leads us to do what isn't good for us and to look for cures in, in all the wrong places? Risk perception has been described as a subjective combination of facts and how those facts feel. And when presented with potential risk, our brains automatically conduct this risk-benefit analysis. But the anatomy of the brain is such that we first react with a feeling and then with a thought. And so the analysis is not necessarily logical or rational. So if something feels good, uh, say eating sugar, uh, we naturally think the risk is lower regardless of how harmless uh, that may actually be. Plus, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, only 12% of adults in the U.S. are considered health literate, which is an amazing statistic. So explanations of health conditions may not be understood and acted upon. So with all of this in mind, how can the medical community accurately and responsibly communicate risk in a way that encourage healthy choices? This is a critical issue, and I'm I'm really excited to uh, be part of this panel. So as just a reminder for everyone who's watching at home, um, if you tag your questions with great challenges on social media, we'll be able to uh, ask them to, uh, to, to the guests live. So Brian, maybe we can start with you. You study and teach risk perception and, and communication every day. Can you speak more about when and why people feel their health is quote unquote at risk? So it's worth starting by thinking about the reality that we don't actually experience risk. Right? As individuals, 
we experience outcomes. Risk is a population level construct. It's an idea that, that we can look at large groups of people and see how many of them have something happen or not. And that's useful for thinking about planning. It's useful for guiding decisions based upon what has happened to other people. But you're never 90% pregnant, you're never 90% alive, and that, that experience of risk is really what we hope is we're going to, things are turn out well, but it's the fundamentally the experience of uncertainty. Um, I mean, you already touched upon one of the other major elements that make us feel about risk, right? We are all both thinking about risk and feeling about risk. And so we have thoughts based upon our, the data that we see that guide the way in which we think about risk, but we also have experience. And one of the key things that guides whether or not we feel at risk is that experience. I mean, part of the problem that we face right now in talking to people, for example, about infectious diseases like polio or pertussis, uh, putting aside Ebola for the moment, is, you know, our, my grandparents had personal experience with these diseases. They knew people who had them. Today, I don't know anybody who's had polio. I don't know anybody who has had firsthand pertussis, and that lack of experience is changing the way in which I and all of my, my colleagues feel about risk. Um, a couple other things just to mention quickly. Um, the degree to which we feel like we have control matters a lot to whether or not we feel at risk. You know, uh, when I feel like I can control something, uh, I feel less concerned about it. When something feels out of my control, that's much more uh, unnerving. Um, and then also there's some old but very good work that, th that classifies risks on two basic factors, both of which I think are really relevant. One, by how much we know about something. You know, when a risk is unknown, when I've never heard of it before, when it's, it's the first time I'm exposed to it, it's much more concerning to me than after it's something I see on a day-by-day -day basis, right? We all know that the risks of car crashes are, are unfortunately all too common, but we don't worry about it that much because it's, it's just something we're very familiar with. And then the last factor is what was used to be referred to as dread. You know, things that evoke those sort of catastrophic, awful images in our minds are things that we're always going to worry more about. Absolutely. Well, some, some great, very interesting points. Um, David, you know, your clinical expertise is in adolescence, and there's five dudes here on the, uh, on the show, and I'm sure we were all adolescents at one point um, and probably done some risky things in our lives. Is there something about us as a group, as young men, that make us more likely to underestimate risk level? Well, I'd first like to talk about it adolescent risk and adolescent risk it seems to be a cultural lens particularly around sexual and risk sexual behaviors but we tend to hear that teens think that they're invulnerable but the invulnerability literature really doesn't support that adolescents perceive risk any differently than adults except in one area and that really as Brian spoke is really about a uh, lack of life experiences to guide them uh, in their choices now, the, we have new brain development research that uh, sort of supports this in a different way. We've put it in the context of risk, but what the reality of brain, uh, the, the brain development research has said is that the frontal cortex, our decision-making sort of entity for our brain, doesn't fully develop till our mid-20s. And so we're, we have different, um, we have more impulse uh, we don't have as much impulse control as we need to in the context of early adolescence and middle adolescence, but sort of it develops sort of in the mid-20s. And so uh, basically because of experiences, as we know, the brain development, it's the pruning uh, due to experiences that the brain sort of really hones in its sort of um, synapses so that we behave better and sort of have the uh, frontal cortex sort of working as well as we should. So now add males into the picture. Uh, so males, we overlay uh, a cultural sense of hegemonic masculinity or sort of sort of the overview of how males should act in a culture uh, and different cultures see that in many different ways and so from uh, if just putting one part in an anecdote culturally uh, we have if you've ever read the book Darwin Awards, most of those uh, sort of anecdotes or those stories are really about male behavior and particularly about male group behavior that really help, uh, puts them at risk for make, making really bad decisions. Um, if we think about sexual risk in sort of adolescence, the idea is sex, sex is a human behavior. We want eventually to do that in a healthy way. We've overlaid risk 
and sort of the concept of risk over it, appropriately so for HIV and for STIs. However, there are really a lot of powerful, positive aspects to sex, obviously, or, or else we wouldn't do it, but the idea is that most individuals, adolescents or humans, aren't really thinking about risk when they're engaged in sexual behavior. So it puts a challenge in sort of how to think about risk in the concept of some of our clinical and public health outcomes. Absolutely. Well, that's very, very interesting. And I guess what it makes me think of is how we communicate this. And I know, Tom, you're a communication researcher and evaluator by trade. What have you found to be some of the biggest uh, hurdles and challenges in communicating risk to the public effectively? Well, part of that is thinking about how the public receives that information, which is really the basis of a lot of our research. When we spend time talking to consumers and patients and family members about how they take in that information, the process they go through as they think about it or receive that information. And unfortunately, one of the issues is that that, that is often not necessarily the center point of the way in which risk communication is created. Um, from an audience standpoint, from a consumer, oftentimes the question is much more broad and based in the decision. In other words, as I look at specific risk perception, let's talk about uh, sexual risk, for example, this last conversation we've just had. As I think about that, I'm thinking about a very, very broad-based set of questions, should I, should I not? Um, it, it, what's, what, what is the ultimate uh, decision or trade-off that I'm going to be pulling? In other words, when I think about that, I may think about what will my life feel like if that risk should occur, right? Not, not the probability of my having the car accident or the sexually transmitted disease, but what life may feel like for me if that probability were to occur. Because of that, there's a translation, there's a contextualization that becomes extremely important. And our thinking then, as we communicate risk, about how you uh, play with that gist, that larger um, perception or that larger dialogue that you're going to have, that, that is very much apart from the statistical probability of something occurring to you. It is, how will I live that out? And our thinking about that is helpful. Part of the issue then is also uncertainty, and so the less certain that we are about that probability, the easier it is for me to address my dissonance, I really want to do this, but I hear it's very risky, by assuming, well, this can't be that accurate, or it must not relate to me, and so easier for me to dismiss. Absolutely. Well, what about, we've had a question actually from, from the public uh, that I just wanted to address that might be relevant to this, which is uh, there was a published study on plastic surgery department in Vanderbilt in the 1980s that showed that patients retain less than 50% of informed consent. So even when you're communicating properly, I mean, I've heard statistics that it could be as little as 5 10% of information. How can we realistically um, manage risk in a situation where the retention of knowledge is not that good. Do you have special strategies to improve uh, improve that in your communication, uh, Tom? Well, again, one of the challenges is that you cannot rely on a single communication in order for that kind of retention to occur. Uh, we certainly are conscious of teach-back devices and other things that can assist in memory retention, but the big mistake is that we assume that I can just tell you it once in some special way and you can overcome those statistics. What it really suggests is that informed consent is an ongoing process and one that has to be continued. Absolutely. Well, Glenn, I'm very interested in your work because you're working with families and it seems like um, you know that, that things can be learned as part of a group and that's a sustainable unit for, for change. Uh, what are some of the um, encouraging aspects of, of communication within families in this area? Um, so, I, families uh, often make decisions um, uh, together, as you understand it. One of the things that we often see in medicine in particular is that the interactions are based one-to-one -one between a clinician and the patient who happens to go in the room, but we know that that particular patient will then go back into their family structure, their friends and families actually, and kind of try and check out whether their understanding uh, is then mediated in this kind of social structure outside that. And one of the ways I think that this is becoming very difficult is that the influences on that 
are from the media, from what they read, from the other people that they take opinions from. And often these are either just as um, problematic in terms of what the media has put forward in terms of a perceived risk or a presented risk, and their social uh, friends have been subject to the same biases in society. So one of the challenges I think we're all facing is how do we frame information such that it's kind of made really an easy to understand and that is presented as um, uh, trade-offs between different um, uh, options. And then how do you make that distributed across a group of people who then trust the source of that knowledge? Because one of the real challenges we have in any kind of risk communication is people don't know whether it's a trusted source or whether or not there's a spin or a bias or a hype in the information channels they're getting. So families, like everybody else, depend on understanding whether there's a trusted source, I think, for the information and how that's presented in ways that they can really understand the gist of it. And I think Brian's done an awful lot of work in this area. Yeah, Brian, I'd love to have your, your follow-up on that. I mean, is there, we've had a question from Amy Lynn Smith, is there even a better way of framing the word risk to help people understand the issues that they should be aware of? Well, I think part of this is a question of goals, right? Why are we talking to people about risk in the first place? And risk communications can accomplish many different goals. And the more that we as communications practitioners, as clinicians, are aware of those different goals, the better we, chance we have of framing, as Glenn put it, the information in a way that's going to be useful, right? Sometimes we want to provide information to help people recognize that a risk exists, right? They need to be aware of a possibility. And we might want to talk about possibility risks very differently than situations that like some of the ones that Glenn's talking about in which patients are facing a trade-off between different options, situations in which each option has possible risks that may be larger or smaller or have different experiences or characteristics that they need to think about and weigh in order to weigh based upon their own values in order to decide what's right. Um, I think also one of the things that we need to recognize here is that Risk communication is at least as much, if not more, about the context into which we put risk information than what the number is that sells, right? I can shape what you feel about a particular risk number by giving you different standards of comparison. And thus, in many ways, the task for us is to think about what is the relevant comparisons that will help you make the best decision in this particular moment in this situation. Absolutely. Well, you, you mentioned there the different numbers that, that I could see. Maybe, um, Thomas, you'd love to, to add into this. I, I'm just concerned maybe that statistics is not a universal language. Uh, is there a better universal language for risk communication? Well, James, you mentioned from the very beginning about low health literacy as being one of our problems. And we know numeracy is even worse than uh, literacy. And so, yes, yeah, statistics may not be that. But realize that Statistics always communicate value to us and, and is always based upon uh, some type of interpretation. We take a look, let's say, at some of the more typical ideographs that we can use in risk communication, uh, where we might show a group of 100 people, and then you see the eight in red that may be of uh, higher risk, et cetera, a very typical kind of graphic. And what people see is that's a lot or that's a little. Right, we automatically turn statistics into some type of, again, and I think Brian said it so beautifully, some type of framed interpretation. And so one of the things we have to do is help people frame that interpretation better. What do the numbers mean? And, and how does interpreting those numbers, especially given the fact that we're going to interpret them differently, help us sort of understand what that ultimate value is. is. Is my risk high? Is my risk low? Is my risk moderate? And again, we tend to shy away from that because we want to put our emphasis in statistics when, in fact, our consumers are just thinking about value. Absolutely. Glenn, you'd like to add something to that? Yes, and I, James, I just noticed the, the question that's come in about where does the responsibility lie to try and do this communication about risk and options? Does it lie um, with the patient to kind of make the questions or to ask or you know, to disagree or to put their preferences on the table, or does it lie with the clinician? And I think the question that we've just had in uh, kind of questions where the responsibility lies, and 
I think it's firmly on the professional, actually, to say, first of all, like Brian was suggesting, um, and I've seen in many studies, if you uh, assume that you're here to consent somebody to a procedure or to a treatment, then the framing language you use will be about, let's try and get you to understand what's going on so that we can do it. But if you use a different frame about, we actually have choices here, we have to compare alternatives, and immediately the conversation changes to let's describe what the issues are for both options and then I need to become really curious about the things that matter to you and where your risk trade-offs lie. Are you somebody who really values quality of life over, over length of life or you value this over that? So you need to tailor your risk attributes and probabilities to the things that matter most to the people in front of you. And you need to use the right language and the right uh, numbers. And we, we've really seen a lot of development using icon arrays, which are these um, graphs of 100 people and so on, to make sure that people understand what the population level risk is, as well as risk relative in the different options. And these are things that I think we're learning how to um, inform people um, from different social strata with different health literacy. Uh, Clint, I mean that's quite a good. That's a good point. I just would love to ask you about what it takes. First of all, it sounds like that takes a lot of emotional intelligence, right? But second, it sounds like that takes quite a lot of time. In a, in a very short visit, dealing with somewhere where you, it takes a while to find out those those details. How how can we aim to do that in a seven minute office visit? Um, you're right, it, and I think seven minutes is really a big challenge. So you may need more than one. Uh, this is because my experience as a clinician is as soon as you put different options on the table, people understand, oh, this is more complicated. They really need some information to take to themselves to understand and for their families to understand so that they can deliberate more carefully about this. So it's not fair to put somebody under pressure in a seven-minute consultation to make a snap decision. So I think we need to see this as a process rather than a one-off encounter. Um, I'm, I'm sure maybe David has to uh, say something to say on this too. Right. I, I wanted to put this in, in into context, especially with adolescents, uh, and I'd say put it into their context as we've been talking about putting in a patient's uh, context and people's context. One, from an adolescent development standpoint, we got, uh, it's on the professional to understand where they are in their development and think about uh, concrete thinking versus abstract thinking. The concrete thinker basically is focused on the here and now and really can't abstractly think about any outcomes in the future. And so understanding that, we have to approach our, our conversations with adolescents and sometimes many adults very differently. Uh, a strategy not necessarily of, of approaching and speaking uh, specifically about risk itself, but speaking to what, uh, many of the things all of us are saying is about helping the patient understand the activity behavior in relationship to their risk. And um, I want to say we understand and can put Prochaska's uh, stages of change, sort of where they are. If figuring out what they think about the risk, they've heard lots of details about eating too much, being overweight, uh, having multiple partners, not using condoms, as we, if we want to put those things as far as the risk behaviors. But then having teasing out, there, there's a strategy of uh, motivational interviewing fr from a patient perspective that really asks them about, in the context of that behavior, what are their pros and cons of sort of continuing to behave in the same way? And once there is sort of some degree of movement which you have to uh, discern, then you can uh, sort of help them think through their, how they're going to move forward. But it's only until you recognize that they are at a point of changing their behavior can you actually do that. So speaking to the time issue in a uh, clinical setting. The idea is you're not going to beat yourself over the head trying to get someone that isn't thinking about their behavior from a risk perspective to move forward to, to taking action. You really have to say, 
well, why don't we come back to this next time and readdress this and sort of think through through where you are the next visit. But I'm concerned about these behaviors, and so sort of leaving it that. So the 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 visit doesn't always have to take long. You just really have to recognize where the patient is in relationship to their perception of risk and their their ability and and desire to change. David, I'd like to follow up with that. You know, in that kind of situation where potentially the 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 teenager or the adolescent may feel a sense of sort of fear or shame or embarrassment. Is it easy to keep them coming back to the physician, or are you getting to a point where they're going to maybe um, you know scare the uh, the adolescent away from from that conversation because it's embarrassing or it's not something they want to talk about in front of their mom or something like that? Well, so we we make a really great point about not having parents in the room most of the times when we're discussing uh, some of these behaviors. So it is. Uh, on the onus of the clinician to create the space and part of creating the space is developing that relationship that they can have this open communication with and know that they can sort of be challenged but challenged from a genuine the, re the trusted source and sort of the relationship is important in the context of this one-on-one -on -one, uh, sort of discussion about where they are in their risk behaviors. Oh, that's great. I appreciate that. Well, just so you know, um, something was mentioned earlier about Brian's Icon Array uh, site, and we're going to be tweeting that out. So if you're interested in finding out, go to Twitter, follow TedMed, and um, you can get that. It's IconArray.com. Um, so yeah, I'd like to go uh, back to you uh, on this, uh, Thomas, to, to share a little bit about um, you know some of these, clarify some of these trade-offs uh, prior to the visit. What are you? What are some of your thoughts on uh, on how we can? Uh, evolve some best practices with this? Well, one of those, I think, has come out of the Aligning Forces for Quality, um, which is a, a set of communities that are addressing a number of issues about engaging patients and families into care. And around shared decision-making specifically, one of those communities, Western New York, has been doing quite a bit. I was just up in Buffalo speaking on this. And joining me was Ellen Goodman, who spoke about the conversation project, with, which many of you are familiar with. The concept here is that we, we can't put all of this effort into the seven-minute clinical visit, but we can be working with our communities. And media plays a really critical role in this, in helping communities start to have conversations about those very key values that Lynn was talking about. Quality of life versus length of life. How should I experience my end of life? What is most important to me and what really matters to me are conversations that we can be having in churches and community centers in other places so that a group of patients can, can have already thought about many of these decisions when they arrive at their clinician's office. It's it, impossible for a clinician to have that depth of conversation and here's a place where the entire community could be assisting us. Absolutely, yeah. It seems like more and more in the world of public health, um, we're getting into going to people where people actually live and, and having those conversations there rather than just waiting uh, for the appointment and the doctor because that's when you know time is really getting squeezed. What are some of the other areas where we can start to have these um, these conversations? You mentioned church. Uh, I would think maybe workplace, given you know the, the employer's uh, costs uh, that are related to this, that may be a good place. Are there, are there other places that are successful in this? You know, part of what Ellen Goodman has been trying to do in the conversation project has been getting families to simply have this conversation at the dinner table. And, uh, and again, there are some wonderful guides to assist those families. So really, every place in the community is an appropriate place. Uh, the conversations that are happening in, in shopping lines at the grocery store about Ebola could be better informed and uh, could, could, are actually having an impact. So there are many places where we can be applying tools and facilitating to have those conversations. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that with the family because it sounded earlier like there might be some potential for what we used to call growing up Chinese whispers. I think I'm not sure if that's a PC term, but it maybe is called telephone and other places where you have like you know one piece of information that you know maybe gets distorted by the time it's gone two or three through two or three people. Uh, is there ways now with technology where we can create tools online, videos, those kind of things to be able to make sure that the information is is being passed is accurate and repeatable and maybe that it couldn't have done in a pre-tech era? 
think there is. Um, one of the things that um, uh, some research groups are doing, um, and that many of them are on, are trying to take the kind of scientific process um, of, you know, there are thousands, thousands of primary studies, and then these are distilled into usually using a systematic review where you pool all the studies, and you try and figure out when you've done all the different trials, whether you've got an effect this way or that way, whether it's positive or negative. And these are called systematic reviews. And um, often the Cochrane collaboration has put these reviews together. They're very high quality reviews. But these are too difficult for patients and families and people in the lay world to get their heads around. What we really need to do is the next step is to translate these kind of rigorous synthesis of evidence into simpler tools that people can understand virtually within a few minutes, or maybe even less than a minute. You say, visually, I understand whether if I do this, I have more benefit on this particular problem versus more harm on this particular outcome. And I think uh, we're beginning the science now of translating these tools into things that can be used in clinical encounters, but can also be used by patients at home. And there's the next challenge for us, is to make these tools, which are simple, highly trusted, highly high quality, immediately available on a Google search. Because at the moment, people can't find them. Um, that they don't know what to trust. They go to Google and they found a thousand different kind of slants on things. So we need to make sure we've got some kind of pathway from your search to a trusted source of very useful tools for patients. And this is a real challenge for, the, uh, for our field and for risk communication in general, I think. Well, Brian, maybe I'd like to come to you on this because it seems like that what's actually happening right now as far as this risk being communicated in, in communicable chunks is the media. And the media tends to focus on, you know, on individual cases or, or versus population rates. Um, what do you what do you think? I'd love to just talk about like how this is being communicated right now, because obviously, you know, whatever content you deliver is going to be in competition with a lot of other content, and uh, the mainstream media has the sort of biggest access to the most people most quickly. What are some of the issues with regard to the media and risk perception and communication? Sure. I mean, I think the the core of the problem is what you described. That whether we're talking about the professional media or even if we're talking about social media, what gets talked about about risk is usually individual cases, right? It's individual people's stories of this bad thing happened to me and I think it was caused by X. Those kinds of stories are incredibly emotionally powerful precisely because there is a part of the way in which we process risk that is inherently experiential. And when we don't have our own experience to rely upon, we're more than happy to build upon other people's experience. This is why you know, knowing someone who had this happen to them is so powerful to us. The problem, of course, is that individual stories are never going to be representative of the broader set of experiences that could possibly occur. right? If I see one person who had that bad thing happen to them, whether that's they got a particular disease or they got sick or whatever, I did, that provides me no information about how common or rare that is. And, the, and nor does it even give me a sense as to whether their experience is an average person's experience of that condition or a particularly bad experience of that. And so the media by nature, I mean, we have to acknowledge the media is trying to sell advertising time, they're trying to sell their people to watch them, and the more emotional they can make the story, the more likely people are to be wanting to follow it. But that doesn't make it an effective way of communicating risk, precisely because the most emotional things, the most emotional stories, are not representing the broader experience of the population. And so what we have to do is figure out how to both use those types of stories to represent examples this could happen, but so could this happen, and so could this happen. And to provide quantitative information that helps people understand, yes, this might happen, but it's really unlikely. Or yes, this might happen, and this is in fact much more, much more common. And so the combination of information may be what's required to give people all the pieces they need. 
And do you think it's inherently more difficult now than it was? Because, you know, when I was growing up in England, there were five TV stations, or four actually, when I grew up. And now, you know, I live in America and there's a thousand choices. Never mind, everyone can sort of be their own media station now. So, you know, it's diluted whereby people are getting their information from. So it's not like we can make the sort of changes that were sort of possible when there was only a few stations. I do think that's part of it. I honestly think the social media issue and the availability of information via the Internet is a bigger issue. Right. right now, if one person somewhere in the world believes that having a vaccination caused a particular harm, that's a global story. In, in the era before that kind of information presentation, I would never hear about it. In fact, I wouldn't hear about anything that didn't occur within 10 miles of where I live. And the available events transforms the conversation about risk because now, precisely because it is rare, it gets shared, and now it seems much more prevalent than it actually is. Absolutely, uh, Thomas. You want to you want to come in on that? I know communication is sort of an area where you're you're focused. What are your thoughts on on media and, and what uh, Brian just shared? Well, it's fascinating, and Brian's exactly right. That, you know, again, this is the availability heuristics. So the more that I have around me, the more I have available to me to uh, to counter to, to to encounter more likely I am going to, to start to believe something. And so, again, this is why that conversation with the physician is so very important, but and also with the community. Our ability to process what we're hearing in the media, our ability to talk to, and, you know, frankly, it's the very same social media and the same Internet that allows for those conversations to happen. Uh, I think one of the things we have to do is not fight against that, uh, that media, but, in fact, work with. And, and start to figure out how we can create more balanced, better messages, how we can accomplish both of our interests. If yours is obviously an avid followership of them going to also respond to all those commercials, uh, but is also has some real public health information to provide. But there's a way for us to collaborate more. I think what happens when we push away from media and sort of lame media is that we lose some of those opportunities. What do you think? I mean, this is just a more, I guess, ge more general question. But you know, because media has just been in the business of selling advertising, and because the biggest spenders on advertising are pharmaceutical companies, it, we have seen a big backlash. You know, on people leaving media, like MSNBC lost fifty percent of its viewers, CNN lost fifty percent of its viewers, because people just don't trust what's coming out of that. They realize that it is um, driven by by those kind of things. Is that a thorn in our side, or is that that something that is, uh, you know, has potential for maybe long-term positive value. There, on um, one, there, there's a whole sort of um, media um, evolution that many people believe we're going through, and we're starting to see again much more specialized media. So you and I are to a place where we can choose our outlets. I think you said it beautifully earlier when you said that. You know, earlier you just you only had so many choices, and now you can create your own media connection. Uh, the challenge about that then is clearly what we do for dissemination because now it becomes a million times harder for us to get a message out if everyone has their own media channel. And again, we have to rely upon social networks in a much stronger way, which again just makes it more complicated. If everyone's watching NBC, then let's get on Need to Know. If <laughs> everyone's on two million channels because they've developed their own network, we'll have a harder time. Well, maybe we need to partner with someone like Apple. If they can put U2's new album on every uh, iPhone in the world, then uh, maybe they can put the truth about the Evo uh, Ebola uh, outbreak as well. Maybe that would be uh, would be uh, be interesting. David, I'd love to, to come back to you on, on thoughts about um, about uh, adolescence because it seems like uh, you know that there's very much a, a peer to peer communication and um, and uh, and uh, credibility between groups when probably when it comes to risk perception there shouldn't be anything like that and obviously social media has sort of amplified that again uh, where do you where do you see that um, playing a role either positively or negatively in, in outcomes with adolescence I guess what one thing I would say is not only for adolescents and somewhat tying into the media uh, piece uh, particularly around uh, let's say vaccines uh, and sort of the anti-vaccine groups are equally um, put in connect 
connection with true scientists around vaccine risk and effect efficacies. And that's not doing our overall public knowledge good. It's like we should limit the, the exposure from the context of some of our uh, media exposures to relative weights of, of science. And that's not being done. Uh, so in relationship to the question about adolescents, they also, in a sense, take their, their um, peers' word at, at times more than they do adults' word. However, if they are engaged uh, and can engage in a conversation with a trusted adult that actually knows the risks, they will listen. And it's really about sort of creating that relationship that they can hear it. They may not look like they're hearing it, they might not act like they're hearing it, but they actually are overall. Yeah, uh, Brian, you want to jump in on that? Well, I just I think it's important to to remind ourselves that the the social media conversation about any risk uh, is dominated by the people who have the most extreme positions about that, and the most common experience. Um, so I thought about this in the context of vaccination, right? You can go online and you can see see lots of posts by people who are very skeptical of vaccines. You can go online and see lots of site uh, information from government sites and others saying very pro-vaccine. The most common experience is honestly people who say, huh, this is really confusing. I just want to do the best thing for my, for my kids. Help me understand this. Uh, reassure me and let's go on with life. Um, that's where most people live. And somehow we need to make sure that those people can also get their needs met. Um, be respected for the fact that they perhaps have questions, or have concerns about risk, but also be their be their engagement and their willingness to be engaged, uh, have that be met. Um, it, it's hard because social media, in fact, the media environment right now in general, is so dominated by extremes because we can steer ourselves to people who agree with us on particular things. Um, but from a communication standpoint. We have to rec remember, just like the, the median experience of getting vaccinated is that nothing happens, the median experience of most people thinking about vaccination is not either of the extremes, but somewhere in the middle. Well, that's an interesting point, and, and maybe this is a perfect opportunity to, to talk about, uh, you know, my, my degree was in economics, and in economics we have a, an idea of negative externalities. And so, yes, the medium uh, experience of one vaccine is certainly, you know, is certainly a, um, you know, is certainly no experience. But then, the medium experience of the first coal factory in Beijing, you know, wasn't a big deal either uh, until there were tons of them and you couldn't see your hand in front of you. And so, do you think that there's not a, a sense of the public looking to see that? Okay, you know, on a on a grander level, there may be things that um, that we're not looking at because everyone's sick. We're 56th in infant mortality. Um, maybe, maybe, you know, the public sort of questioning as to whether America in particular is, you know, is, uh, is getting these things right on a, on a bigger scale. I mean, that's just, I know some of the questions that I hear from, from people and some of my own thoughts are just, uh, you know, we're very good at examining the micro. We've got very good at reductionism, but if we take a step back and we see, you know, people are getting, people are really sick well, um, and, and we don't seem to have very good explanations for it. What do you think is uh, is that helping, har harming, hurting? What do you think? So uh, the concept that this evokes in me is the idea that people have mental models of risk, right? That it, we're not just talking to people about you are at risk or you aren't at risk, but we also are trying to talk to people about why, to help them understand the relationships between their situation or their behavior and why they might be more or less at risk, and. Those kinds of qualitative conversations about risk are as important, if not more important, because that's what will help people understand how their own choices can then influence what their what kinds of risks they will be facing moving forward. And whether we're talking about sexually transmitted disease risk and the relationship between different types of behaviors and those risks, or whether we're talking about uh, infectious disease risks and when something is or is not being transmitted, those kind of communications to improve mental models um, really sometimes be more effective than just telling people, well, this is really rare. 
because that, that gives people better able ability both to feel like they're more under control, but actually to exercise control in the degree to which they face those risks. Absolutely. Well, we've had a question come in about harm reduction philosophy. How does that uh, fit into uh, improving dealing with risk? Thomas, I'm sure that's something you're familiar with. I, I am familiar with it from uh, some other work I've done around substance abuse. And uh, um, harm reduction really sort of assumes that, that there's something we can do to avoid the risk, but we can reduce uh, what happens in terms of the outcome of the risk. And there's certainly an awful lot that um, but that has value to that, except when we get to this larger frame of good or bad, right or wrong. Uh, some of the issues, certainly, that, uh, that some of our panelists face on a regular basis. So, so, in other words, harm reduction when it comes to underage drinking is a challenge because, of course, we have laws about the age of drinking, et cetera, so those sorts of things. I, I want to respond, though, first of all, to something in, in the conversation we've, we've been having that I think is important for us to recognize, um, and that's that what we hear from consumers always is, regardless of the media, regardless of the messages, regardless of the confusion, I still have to live my life. I still have to make a decision. Uh, I still have to do something, uh, because life goes on and I can't wait for anyone to figure all this out. <laughs> and so I think it's particularly important that we think about how we're going to aid individuals who still have to make decisions in the midst of the conundrum, and, and that th those things are still going to happen, and that those decisions, again, are going to be based upon how I envision my life will look or feel as I invoke that decision. The same is true with harm reduction, by the way, and one of the beauties about harm reduction is the ability for us to say, I can... I can still engage in a set of behaviors, but I can do so in a way to minimize uh, the risk that I'm going to ultimately feel or face. Again, notice that that's a translation about how my life will turn out, that I can sort of have this goal that I have in mind um, and still keep myself from facing the highest degree of risk. But it's this figuring it out in a day-to-day -day pattern, the fact that I have to move forward, that's very important for us to keep in mind as we communicate about risk. Absolutely. Well, look, it's it's uh, it's October, and the biggest story in the news right now is uh, is Ebola. And I want to make sure we give a few minutes. I'm sure there are people all over the world that are that are tuning into this because they heard it's on risk, and they trust TedMed, and they want to know what's going on. So, you know, this is something maybe each of you would like to to uh, come on. You know, I am out of the country right now, but the gutter in Williamsburg is my local bowling alley, and uh, the people shop are places that I frequent, obviously. So. Uh, to my family who said that I shouldn't travel because of risk of Ebola, they were completely wrong. But with the recent Ebola outbreak, uh, we've seen reactions uh, that many believe are out of step with the actual risk. So one CNN commentator dubbed this fear Ebola, and uh, some believe that the fear associated with the illness is far more contagious than the disease itself. How did the risk perception of Ebola stray so far from the true risk levels in U.S.? And is there a way to correct this coarse perception at this point with it sort of like the cat being out of the bag? Brian, can you, you want to start us off? Sure. I mean, I think one thing to recognize here is that the emotions that we're feeling about Ebola risk stem not from some kind of analytical thinking about the probability, but from our ability to imagine the possibility. And that possibility, and precisely because the Ebola risk is, as I mentioned before, new, surprising, and, and quite honestly, somewhat gruesome, it evokes lots of those strong emotions in us. Um, I think part of what we need to recognize here is just trying to frame this in probability terms is unlikely to make much of a difference. The fact that there are only a few cases in the US, I'm not worried about how many cases there are now. What people are worrying about is how, what might happen in the future. What could be more useful, I think from my standpoint, is to think about this more from the standpoint of the mental model aspect I mentioned before. How can we help give people the tools so that they can better understand under what specific circumstances they would be at risk. Precisely because when you have a clear signal about what constitutes the times when you are at risk, you also get a clear signal about all the times when you are not. And having that clear guidance, I think, would help people to recognize analytically that their personal likelihood of contracting Ebola really is very, very small. 
even as we also acknowledge and validate the fact that the possibility of Ebola is going to evoke fear in us, and that we just have to acknowledge that and, and respond to it. Can statistics compete with the film Outbreak? <laughs> the idea of that, I mean, seriously, I think that's what's going on in a lot of people's mind. They see, you know, the president looking at the, you know, the country and they say, oh, well, if it's one cases in three days, it's going to be a million cases. I mean, I really think that is a lot of what's going through people's mind. And the statistics of how virulent it is compared to measles or other things is just not, I mean, it's got a scarier name as well. That's, that's what most people are processing with risk, not... Um, you know, not really, uh, not really the, the facts of the, the transmission. Um, you know, thoughts on that, uh, Gwen, uh, Glenn? Sorry. I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, um, and, and like, it's very little to add to what Brian has said. Actually, that it's the emotional um, uh, dread, or something that he's uh, mentioned before. The dread factor here is what's driving the perception as well as, I think, um, in some cases, relatively little knowledge about the real transmission. Um, and so when you think that if you even come into the same city as somebody who's got um, uh, Ebola, that you may be at risk. And there's some strange idea of somebody not traveling to Dallas at some point in the news, I think. That that, that kind of sense of knowledge about the contagion mechanism is just unavailable to people. And if you combine that with the dread factor, we see what we see now. However, here's the real problem, is that in the past, and I think this has happened with, in the UK, I remember the mad cow disease, and also with other different kind of uh, public health scares, is that the government wasn't always transparent um, about the probabilities and wasn't really transparent about the truth. So the trust level in public information often is um, at a low level. And I think if you combine those two issues of low trust in public information plus the dread issues, then you end up with a top toxic mix that the media, of course, are ventilating. So it's, I think this is a kind of um, combined issue of public information plus the media responsibility to calm it down a little bit. I completely agree with you on that, Glenn, and I'm not sure if uh, President Obama hugging that nurse did any help either, because people are thinking to themselves, hey, you can't be that bad, she looks she looks pretty well, and uh, and uh, why is Obama hugging her? She hasn't been away for 21 days. I mean, I'm not sure if it's helping or, or hurting one way or another. Look, I, I, I really appreciate all of you sharing on, on Ebola. I know it's a big thing, but I think we can just all share with people that, look, it's not as, as big of a thing, and it doesn't have that, uh, you know, you need to really start to, you know, not be so uh, fearful of it, and hopefully there'll be more tools for that in the future. But it, we are running out of time here, and I wanted to make sure to hear from each of you again. Um, this is the last question I have for each of you, and maybe we could just go through in turn and, and perhaps start with you, Thomas, is what is the most important change that the medical community needs to make in order to encourage accurate risk perception and consequently healthy behaviors? Well, my answer is going to be a little biased, and, and, and only because my interest is, is constantly on how we engage patients and families into the entire process, and that includes the shared decision making and risk perception, risk tool process. And so part of the question is, uh, how can we incorporate patients and families into the development of some of these tools and technologies? How do we help them help us to uh, think more in line with the way that they think, um, to uh, show us a little bit more about the ways in which they interpret information so that we can create tools that are far more uh, connected and patient-centered and, and consumer-centered. And so to me, the greatest need that we have is doing an even better job in decision science and engaging uh, with individuals who, who are ultimately users of this and allowing them to help us design uh, the kinds of tools that, that will be effective for the audience. That's great. And that, I guess that takes us straight on to David. David, in, in your particular group that is probably the riskiest of all the, the groups out there, what are, what are some of the main things that need to be spread in order for us to uh, get more healthy behaviors and get accurate risk perception? So 
I might, might be speaking a bit of heresy, but I think the concept of assessing risk is a human issue, and it also is uh, inherent upon all of our medical community being on the same page, which we're not always on the same page about specific risk uh, perceptions and how we communicate risks. So I, th uh, I think one area that we might concentrate on, uh, even in our, in our medical um, education as well as our continuing education, is how to, con how to improve our perceptions of risk in the medical community and as well as all of our uh, uh, speakers have been spe uh, speaking to about how to communicate it much better than we might be doing at the um, current way. So I think it is there is a responsibility within the medical community. And when I say the medical community, it is not only doctors, it's medical assistants, it's nurses, uh, they're nurse practitioners. Every step of the way, patients get messages about different issues in, uh, that are related to their health, and we all need to be on the same page about those risks. I mean, I just have to jump in there. How, how easy is that going to be to do that when you see that medicine is really, like, typically 15 years behind the science? I mean, I've still seen things in New York City talking and communicating risks, you know, in, in, in a way that's completely opposite to the new studies, say, on the microbiome, um, where, uh, you know, the microbiome has really come in and thrown us all for a doozy in the way that, you know, we've had to see germs very differently than we've seen before. How hard is it going to be to get everyone on the same page when science is changing very rapidly and in some cases giving us completely the opposite um, need and, and maybe that's uh, Glenn you've been in, in clinical practice how, how do you uh, how do you see it from from that point of view when when uh, the science uh, of certain things is, is changing quickly yeah that, that, that's a major challenge I completely agree with you James uh, and I was just thinking about this with the recent wave of interest in using statins for people at risk of heart disease mm -hmm. but actually you know, one of the things that people really don't get is that their smoking habits or their blood pressure or their exercise levels are much more of a contribution ever to their future risk than a possible addition of a statin or not. And so what I would like here is a, a population to have a new vaccine, actually, which is called healthy skepticism. And I really want clinicians to kind of have this available for every patient who works at the door. Absolutely. And, and Glenn, just to follow on with that question that I asked before, what would you see as the most important change? Is, would you say that that's a healthy skepticism vaccine or is there, a, is there a other areas that you feel could, uh, could help, particularly where it comes to your work with families? So I come back to this issue of uh, tools that are shared widely and shared publicly and have some kind of mechanism to say these are from a trusted source. Now, that, how to create that trusted source is something that we need to grapple with because stamping it with a government stamp is not enough, clearly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Brian, um, I'd, l I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I know you were the first to, to kick us off, and I'd love to you know, circle around to, to your, your thoughts on sort of some of the most important changes the medical community needs to make to, to uh, get healthy behaviors. Well, I think I, I'll end with... What I say to most of my students, which is, uh, we need to get out of the frame of mind of thinking that the question is, have I given the patient the right number? Have I given the patient the right specific piece of data? And step back and ask us ourselves why it is that we're providing that information in the first place. What is our goal? Because whether not only whether we should be providing a number at all, but what kind of format we should use, what kind of structure, whether it should be in some kind of a decision support, whether it should be a risk calculator. All of those tools are designed to meet specific needs. And they are, you know, one does not do what you would want it to do in a different context. And I, I too, altogether too often here in medicine, in public health, well, we, we gave them the information, therefore we've informed them. I just wish that the medical community and the public health community would be willing to sort of step, take a step back and take the responsibility to say, no, it's not enough to just provide information. We have to take the responsibility for deciding what are we trying to accomplish with our audience at any given point in time, and then to design the way in which we talk about risk to meet those specific needs. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing. It's been a power packed uh, group. You know, I hope maybe next time I know we have these regular conversations on risk. Maybe we should have a, a member of the inherently less risky sex as part of the panel as well. So that they can share, uh, why, um, you know, how, how they avert risk. But it's been a very thought provoking discussion. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, thank you for your comments and questions. Uh, please continue to share your thoughts. That you know, the goal of this uh, Great Challenges program is to really keep the conversation going on between the events, and uh, we really appreciate all of you for uh, coming on and watching. If you're watching live or you're watching on the replay, we will be back next month with uh, another live event. In the meantime, uh, thank you so much again to our guests. My name is James Maskell. I'm uh, from Revive Primary Care. It's been great. Being being on here. Such a pleasure to be part of the TED Med community and um, we'll see you next time.